Okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff the geneticists talked about this morning. It's going to be um, consolidation. Um, but I'm also going to talk quite a bit about the skin. So I have no conflicts with industry relevant to this. Uh, so as we said, Ehlers-Danlos, you're told it's 1 in 5,000. I agree it's probably more like 1 in 100 to 1 in 600 when you take hypermobile type into, effect, into account. In general, the cardinal features of the Ehlers-Danlos spectrum, hyperextensible skin, hypermobility of the joints, and tissue fragility, whether it's the blood vessels being a little bit more fragile and people saying they bruise more easily, or the skin being more fragile. There's many different types of EDS as we saw. And so this was the Villefranche uh, criteria. So these are the classic six that they condensed it down to. So the classic type is where you get the very atypical scarring with the hypermobility. The hypermobile type is where you get the hypermobility and the pain as a primary feature. The vascular type is where you get arterial rupture and small joint hypermobility, but not large joint. Kyphoscoliotic type is characterized, you first notice it from the hypotonia, and then again scarring, and there's a subset that have the globe rupture. The arthrochalasia type, again picked up with hypotonia and the congenital hip dislocations. And then the very, very rare one, dermatosporaxis, is where you have that extremely thin skin and scarring potential again. A very, uh, very fragile type. So the genes affected in the majority of Ehlers-Danlos are the fibrillar collagens, or the enzymes that we saw that process the fibrillar collagens. So if you carry a genetic abnormality, how does it manifest? So there's three different ways it manifests, and these are genetic terms. One means, one's called haploinsufficiency. What this means is that something affects the expression of that gene, so you have less of the protein product, and that's a haploinsufficiency. Secondly, you can have what's called a dominant negative effect. So when we'll go through collagen, it's three molecules wrapping around themselves. They could be the same molecule or they could be three different ones or two different ones. If one of them's wrong, it'll make the whole structure wrong. And that's a dominant negative effect. Only the one's wrong, you've got one or two normal things, it affects the whole structure. And then finally, it could be a mutation that comes out in the protein that causes uh, the collagen to be very soluble, whereas collagen should be very insoluble and give us some resilience, or it weakens the strength of the collagen. So others down those primarily disturb collagen fibrillogenesis, or that means in the making of the collagen. So the morphology and the strength of collagen is somehow compromised. So collagen is the major protein in our skin, our ligaments, our tendons, and our bones. There's many different types of collagen. And so some places you have like cartilage is collagen two and nine. Skin is a whole bunch of different collagens. And this is a problem of what we call fibrillar collagen. Those are those collagens that rotate around each other and make what's called a triple helix. So the skin is composed of three big uh, components. Collagen is the big one. Elastin is another component of skin and collagen and elastin assort together. And in between all this is something we call ground substance. And these are a whole bunch of little proteins and sugars that bring water into the skin and modify the collagen and the elastin. So in Ellers Danlos you hear different terms about the skin. You hear that it has a velvety texture. Sometimes you'll hear have a doughy texture. There's one type, the vascular type, where it's very thin skin, or the classic type, where it's very hyperextensible skin, and that's where you use the volar forearm or an area that doesn't have damage from the sun, and it should pull out and snap back. If it doesn't snap back, that says there's a problem with elastin rather than collagen. Okay, so what I'm gonna go through is I'm gonna go through how we make collagen and how we get all the different Ehlers-Danlos. I'm then going to look at briefly the other molecules that contribute to the stability of the collagen, the elastin and the ground substance. Then I'm going to look at the ultrastructure of collagen in Ehlers-Danlos, and this is the role of electron microscopy. Then I'm going to talk about small fiber neuropathy diagnosis from the skin in Ehlers-Danlos, and then make some recommendations based on the skin. 
Okay, so collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. In your skin, it's 70% of the dry weight. As we said, there's 29 proteins, collagen proteins. There are more genes because like collagen 5 has three different genes, um, even though it's only making the one collagen 5 molecule. So the definition of a collagen is that it's this triple helix, three, three things that roll around each other, three proteins, and they have a little amino acid that uh, allows them to group together, and then they have two chunky amino acids that are on the outside, and those are hydroxyl, and these are the proline and hydroxyproline. And it's a structural component of the matrix of our skin. Those three molecules can be the same, and we call those homotrimers, or they can be three different molecules, and we call those heterotrimers. So when we talk about collagens, there's two big classes of collagens. There's the ones that they only have that triple helix, the whole molecule is that triple helix. And then we have ones that have little bits of the triple helix, but it's interrupted by areas that are not triple helix. And these are called non-fibrillar collagens. And these ones often link onto fibrillar collagens and have more of a regulation component. When you look at the fibrillar collagens, they have a very characteristic look to them in that they have a characteristic periodicity. That means they have a characteristic spacing across the molecule, and they orient in that staggered conformation. This is a collagen fiber from the skin. So it's not one collagen. In the skin, all of these collagens come together to form a collagen fiber. So in the skin here, at the core of it is collagen 5, and that's when we see the abnormalities in classic type. Collagen 5 forms the very core, and all the other collagens build on it. Collagen 5 regulates the collagen diameter. The major one that jumps on now is collagen 1. This is the majority of the collagen in the fibril. Collagen 3 is also called our fetal collagen. It makes a little bit of the big collagen fiber. And then on the outside of this, we have those collagens that have the interrupted triple helices. And these are called facet collagens, or fiber-associated collagens with interrupted triple helices. And in the skin, we have 12 and 14. We have a whole bunch of other collagens in the skin, but they're not that important right in the dermis, which is the resilience. There's a whole bunch of them that we use in the epidermis, or to connect the epidermis to the dermis. These are the fibrillar collagens. So these are the ones that ultimately will just have that triple helix. And the ones that are important in the skin are collagens 1, 3, and 5. So 1 is the majority of the collagen, 5 is the middle one, that's the classic type, and 3 is the fetal collagen. So they all have this triple helix. They all have to have the uh, carboxy part torn off at the end when they're being processed and the amino part torn off at the end. And we'll see that there's different types of Ehlers-Danlos that don't do that properly. <clears throat> so if we look at the fibrillar collagen, so this is 1, 3, and 5 in the skin. Collagen 1, I said, was the most abundant one. It's 80% of the dermis. It's two different chains in uh, coming together three times, so the alpha 1 or the alpha 2. And it's the model of fibrillar collagen. So when I'm going to go through how we make up collagen, this is the one I'm going to focus on. If you have a problem with that triple helix forming in collagen 1, you get this condition. And so this is where you see the blue sclera, and the person has a lot of fragility fractures, and this is osteogenesis imperfecta. And thank you to all the patients who consent to their pictures being used for teaching. That was one of my patients. Type 3 collagen is the second fibrillar collagen, and this is called our fetal collagen. This is the one that we make as a fetus and throughout life, and it's the one that gets mixed in with collagen 1 and 5, but it's the important one around all of our organs and around all of our blood vessels. And so type 3 collagen, when you have a problem with this one, you get small joint hypermobility, and you get the vascular type of Ehlers-Danlos, also called the ecchymotic type. That just means you bruise. And there's two different groupings within the vascular type. There's the people you can look at and say, you probably have vascular type, you have the characteristic features, you have earlobes that are, you are lacking earlobes, um, slender nose. You can look at the person, they have a particular characteristic look. And that's called the acrogeric look, because if you look at their hands, their hands look a little bit more aged. 
There's the non-acrogeric type, and those are the ones that you can't look at and say for sure, other than looking at their vessels and seeing their vessels are very prominent. This is the one that's characterized by organ rupture, um, by rupture of blood vessels. This is the one where you want to avoid NSAIDs, you want to avoid contact sports. The one that is the serious one with 25% of people having a vascular rupture or event by age uh, 20 years. The third fibrillar collagen is collagen 5. Remember, this is the center and this regulates the whole fiber diameter of collagen. This is located at the core of all of the collagen fibers. It's three genes, we usually only use two of them primarily. Um, and this collagen fiber is a little bit unusual in that a little piece at the end stays on and it's what a whole bunch of other things will attach to. And it seems to regulate the growth of the collagen. And when you have a problem with this one, you can have atypical scars, you can have large joint as well as small joint hypermobility, you can have herniations, this is a ganglion, and you can have easy bruising. So this is all the um, iron left behind uh, from bruising that's occurred over multiple times in the skin. And then you can get very characteristic types of scars, and these are called molluscoid pseudotumors, and these are just very uh, violent reactions to scars where they build up on each other, and this is the hyperextensibility that you see in this. And this is the classic type of Ehlers-Danlos characterized by the atrophic scars, the hyperextensibility, and the joint laxity hypermobility. And so this is problems in collagen 5. So these are all the fibrillar collagens. So these are the core and Ehlers danlos Now the model is collagen 1 on how we make collagen. So collagen is formed initially as a protein that has to sort together and then it has to be processed so it's formed as a soluble, that means it mixes well and then it becomes insoluble by um, all of its processing. When we're deciding how much collagen to make, there are things that upregulate and help us make more collagen. So these are things like retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is forms of vitamin A. Ascorbic acid, that's vitamin C. Insulin upregulates uh, collagen, that's why you see in diabetes people get thick skin. Collagen is downregulated by steroids, amongst other things. So when you go on steroids, your skin thins. Okay, so when you're making collagen, the first thing is you have DNA, the collagen genes are transcribed, that message goes to your endoplasmic reticulum, and it's started to make into a protein. There's a whole bunch of other little proteins that have to sort with it, associate with it, to help it to fold, those three uh, helices to fold properly. And there's a whole bunch of proteins that modify the collagen. One of the ones that assorts with them very quickly is this peptidoprolosin transisomerase. It's a big name, but it causes when there's a problem with it, the collagen doesn't fold properly. And so you get scars, you get redundant skin, shown here in the belly button, you get hypermobility and extensible skin. And this is that newer type of Ehlers-Danlos, that FKBP14 related Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So this is where you see kyphoscoliosis, myopathy, joint hypermobility, they have hearing loss, which can't be explained yet, and atypical scarring and skin redundancy. Then a whole bunch of proteins modify that collagen while it's still within the cell. And these are things that are going to put some sugar on it so that it's more soluble as it goes out of the cell, or they're going to put some hydroxyl groups on it, which can be modified to make the collagen stronger later on. And one of the enzymes, lysyl hydroxylase, as we saw, the other important thing to point down here, I've highlighted ascorbic acid just to show you that that's a cofactor throughout. So that's vitamin C. So one of the important things in Ehlers-Danlos is vitamin C supplementation when it comes to skin. So the lysyl hydroxylase, if there's a problem with this one and you don't hydroxylate properly and don't strengthen the collagen afterwards, gives you that kyphoscoliotic type. And so this is where you have deficiency of that enzyme and it's characterized, you pick it up very quickly at birth because they have hypotonia. That means a very floppy type of baby at birth. Um, and then they develop kyphoscoliosis over time. Okay, so that triple helix then forms within the cell, and that's called in a department called the endoplasmic reticulum, and then you try to push it outside of your cell. 
And so you stack them all up and you lose different proteins and other proteins are gained at this time and you put it right outside the cell. And then you have to process it. So remember we got to get rid of the um, amino terminal side and the carboxy terminal side. And so on the amino terminal side there's a protein called Adams TMS2 or an uh, uh, amino collagen uh, propeptidase which cleaves off that side. There's a protein that's in the matrix that cleaves off the carboxy side and that's called bone morphogenic protein 1. And then you have a protein that takes all those hydroxyl groups and joins them together so the collagen then becomes insoluble and that's the lysyl oxidase. So when you have a pro problem that you can't get rid of the N-terminus of the collagen to make it insoluble, you get this condition. And this is called dermatospraxis. This is a very rare variant of Ehlers-Danlos, and it's due to not having that enzyme to take off uh, the N-terminus of the collagen. And they get sk severe skin fragility because the collagen doesn't become insoluble. It remains soluble and weak. If there's a problem with the collagen itself and you lose the site where that protein is going to process that N-terminus, then you get the arthrochalasia type of Ehlers-Danlos. And so again, you have soluble collagen, but you don't have the fragility of the collagen. So they're missing the uh, cleavage site. Instead, they get bi uh, bilateral congenital hip dislocations and again, hypotonia and severe joint laxity. So within the cell, what was happening was that message for the collagen was being translated into a protein, and that protein as it was being translated, they had to group up together, remember that protein disulfide isomerase, healed, uh, coiled them up together while all these sugar groups and hydroxyl groups are going on it, and then that triple helix is made, it goes out to outside of the cell, and then at the outside of the cell, you have to clip off the N-terminus and the C-terminus, and then that lysyl oxidase then makes it those hydroxyl groups together, so it's a very strong and now an insoluble collagen molecule, which is giving you resilience to the skin. So without that lysyl oxidase making it insoluble, your collagen is 2,000 times weaker. Okay, so then you group up all these collagens together. You have type 5 collagen right in the center, and that's regulating all these other collagens coming on board. You have then collagen 1 jumping on board, collagen 3 jumping on board, and then these um, ones with interrupted triple helices, collagens 12 and 14 linking on top. And then on top of this, you link with elastin and you link with the ground substance, and that's your dermis. So collagen gives us the strength, elastin gives us the rebound, and ground substance gives us the texture. So elastin forms a continuous network right from the top of your skin, the uh, bottom of the epidermis, right down to the fat layer. So it matures as it goes down. So the deeper you get, the stronger your elastin gets. It may have some effect on collagen regulation, and we see this in hypermobile type Ehlers-Danlos. So most of the Ehlers-Danlos, don't, you don't see any difference in the elastin, but in the hypermobile type, you see that the elastin gets calcified sometimes. Defects in elastin give us different diseases. They give us things like Marfan syndrome, cutis laxa. There's a whole group of these syndromes that we see in dermatology. The third component of the skin is called the ground substance. And this is a whole bunch of proteins and sugars, and the sugars hold water, so this brings uh, the water into the skin and gives the texture of the skin. A lot of these small proteins link on with the collagens, and they actually help to regulate the collagen diameter. So you heard about one called Tenaskin 10. There's a whole bunch of these proteins. There's about 35 of them, and any one of them could probably be involved in hypermobile type. That's why it's probably so hard to find the gene for hypermobile type. And so small joint hypermobility, part of the Biton scale. This is a type of Ehlers-Danlos where we see this little phenomena. This is a benign phenomena where you get little red marks on the outer arms. This is more common in this type of Ehlers-Danlos. This is called keratosis rubra pilaris. Stretch marks are a little bit more common. They can be in unusual places. Um, this is collagen striae. 
This is something you see commonly in many types of Ehlers Danlos, but you see it particularly commonly in this type. These are called piezogenic pedal papules. They don't have to be um, pedal, they can occur around the wrist as well. What happens are these are little herniations of fat through the dermis. The collagen's weaker, so when you put pressure down, you see the fat herniate through. And these are all things you see in the skin in hypermobile type Ehlers Danlos. So this is the most common type of Ehlers Danlos, autosomal dominant. They talk about the velvety skin, plus or minus hyperextensibility. It's not like the classic type where it's really hyperextensible. You have generalized joint hypermobility. You have you can have the chronic joint muscular pain, recurrent joint dislocations, subluxations, symptoms of autonomic dysfunction, easy bruising. And typically, you don't have the atrophic scars. You can have abnormal scars, but they're not what we call atrophic. So the cutaneous features that you see in hypermobile type. So the skin often feels velvety. You get all of these stretch marks, unusual stretch marks, so unusual places, the paesogenic pedal papules. You can have the scars, but they're not the cigarette paper wrinkling scars that we see typically in the classic type. Keratosis pilaris, some uh, people can have slight bluing of the sclera. And one of the things that uh, you tend to see in hypermobile type that you don't see in the other types, in my experience, is the lingual frenulum and the um, labial frenulum. These are the places that attach your tongue to the bottom of your mouth or the uh, lower lip to uh, uh, the gingiva. These are either underformed or not there in hypermobile type. So hypermobile type has no gene to date, but as I said in going through the skin, remember all those proteoglycans that regulate the collagens, all those other collagens, the facet collagens, there's a whole bunch of elastin-related proteins that have a, uh, an, an impact on collagen diameter. So Ehlers-Danlos, deficiencies in collagen biosynthesis and fibrillogenesis. Normal, normally collagen is very tightly regulated. So a person who doesn't have Ehlers-Danlos, their collagens are all the identical size. But Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, there's variation in collagen size and in the periodicity, that spacing between the collagens. And so this is where electron microscopy can be helpful. So when we take a skin biopsy from an area that doesn't see that much sunlight, so there's not a lot of damage from ultraviolet light in the skin. So usually we take it from either the lower back or the inner upper arm. And you do a special thing called electron microscopy on it. This is where you can see up to 500,000 times magnification. Usually we use about 120,000. And you can look at what is the shape and characteristic of the collagen fibrils themselves. If you look at a person who doesn't have Ehlers-Danlos, so you can see that all of the collagens, those round little things in cross-section, all the same size and generally the same distance apart. This is a patient who has classic type Ehlers-Danlos. The collagens are different sizes and every now and then you have these huge collagens and these are called collagen fibrils where you're not regulating the size of the collagen. This is the vascular type of Ehlers-Danlos. You still see that variation in size of the collagen, very small ones and larger ones. You don't typically see the collagen flowers in vascular type, but you see that variation in collagen size. This is that dermatospraxis one. Now this is that one where you had the enzyme deficiency and you couldn't process off the amino terminus of the collagen one. And their collagen looks very bizarre. We call this hieroglyphic collagen. And this is why it doesn't hold together very well. And it sheets off. And then the hypermobile type. Hypermobile type has fluctuation in the size and spacing. And again, you have those collagen fibros, uh, flowers, those very large uh, pieces of collagen. And the other thing you see in hypermobile type is you see there is some problem with the elastin in most patients with hypermobile type that you see these little dark areas and that's elastin that gets calcified. That doesn't typically happen on a sun protected site. Okay, so you can see these EDS variants. Now collagen problems in the diameter and spacing are not specific to Ehlers-Danlos. 
We see it in osteogenesis imperfecta. Remember, that's a problem with collagen 1. But we also see it in elastin disorders as well. So elastin does have an effect on collagen and collagen diameter. There are a few inflammatory diseases where we can see it in scleroderma, scleromyxedema, but these are obvious. The person has an inflammatory disorder that you can see looking at the skin. So something that's sort of new in skin is the small fiber neuropathy. So many patients with hypermobile EDS experience burning sensations, paresthesias, allodynia, cramps, diffuse myalgias, suggestive that there's a small fiber neuropathy, the dysautonomia that we hear about. So what they're starting to do now, and it depends on the experience of the pathologist at your site, is taking a skin biopsy and looking, is there damage to the nerves? So nerves, when they get damaged, they die off and there's fewer nerves. So you look at the density of the small nerves in the skin versus what should be in the normal population. And this can lead towards saying that, yes, this patient has features in the skin of a small fiber neuropathy. We've been doing this in um, erythromyalgia, which is a, a different disease, uh, for several years. It's just beginning to start uh, to be done in Ehlers-Danlos. And then finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the management in Ehlers-Danlos from a skin point of view. So remember, vitamin C, ascorbic acid, was important in the, pro in the uh, making of collagen. There were several steps that you needed vitamin C. You also needed iron. So supplemental vitamin C, and usually we say about two grams per day. Now remember, collagen was upregulated um, by vitamin A, or vitamin A type of analogs. Um, so these are things like retinoids, retinal retinaldehyde, retinol. All of these are good topically on the skin as well, and probably good to supplement, although vitamin A, like fish oils, taste terrible. Um, Avoid glucocorticoids where possible. So steroids thin the skin, we want to avoid them where possible. Especially if it's an Ehlers-Danlos, that's from what we call the haploinsufficiency. Protection from trauma, remember the blood vessels break a little bit more easily, so when we say easy bruising, it's usually easier breakage of the blood vessel. Same with contact sports, avoid aspirin. In people who have a bleeding diathesis, we often use or get them to take transaxaminic acid prior to surgery. It can be very helpful. It helps you clot a little bit easier. If there's a problem with von Willebrand's, then of course vasopressin is going to be helpful. From a skin point of view, surgically, double layer closures as much as possible. So when you're closing a wound, you can put the interrupted stitches on the top, but below that you want to put a support layer, and these are called subcuticular stitches, where, or subcutaneous stitches, where we try to link two areas of the skin together to give you a better hold. Usually we keep the stitches in twice as long, so nipples and above would be 14 days. Normally we only go seven days. Uh, nipples below would probably be 21 to 28 days rather than 14 days. Additionally, taping of bandages with things like stereo strip over the wounds as well can be helpful. Okay, so what I've tried to do is go through the five different areas. Inherited deficiencies in collagen fibrillogenesis or the enzymes, the major proteins of the skin, that we have all of these different things that seem to regulate collagen diameter, which seems to be one of the major problems, or collagen spacing, and that you have deficient tensile strength in the skin. That electron microscopy can be helpful to support what you see clinically. One of the newer things is it might be relevant uh, taking skin biopsies for small fiber neuropathy. And then the recommendations, the simple things you can do, increase the cofactors for collagen biosynthesis, and take the precautions. And that's it.